right. Uh, more people are joining oh. us. Um, maybe let me start by introducing Eric Shin. Um, so it is our great honor to have invited Eric Shin to our uh, distinguished colloquium. Uh, most of us know who Eric is, but let me just briefly introduce him. Um, so Eric Shin is the president of the Mohammed bin Zayed University of uh, Artificial Intelligence, a professor of computer science at Carnegie Mellon University and a founder and chairman of Pentium Incorporation. He completed his PhD in computer science at UC Berkeley. His main research interests are the development of machine learning and statistical methodology and composable automatic and scalable computational systems for solving problems involving automatic learning, reasoning, and decision-making in artificial, biological, and social systems. Professor Xing is a board member of the International Machine Learning Society. He has served as a program chair and general chair of the International Conference of Machine Learning. This is a very short uh, introduction of, uh, of Professor Xing, but without further ado, uh, let's welcome Eric. All right, uh, thank you, Ian, for the uh, very generous introduction. Uh, as you can see, I wear multiple hats, uh, therefore, uh, I'm going to talk about a few uh, practical problems I ran into over the past few years. Uh, let me jump into a acknowledgement. Uh, this work that I'm going to present uh, has uh, been uh, you know, uh, involving uh, a number of uh, my current and uh, previous students, and uh, I'm not going to read out all their names. Uh, now they are all over the place uh, doing, you know, being faculty, postdoc, or uh, entrepreneurs, and so forth. So I want to thank them, you know, for many of the important contributions. Now let me jump into the topic. So as we all know, you know, AI has been experiencing uh, breathtaking advancements in the past few years, and the AI models and systems has been used for solving many problems. Just of AI models used, machine learning models used for predicting uh, protein structures, you know, for smart city electrification, such as uh, you know, facial recognition, autonomous vehicle driving, uh, for generating content, such as uh, interesting images, for playing games, and obvious many robotic applications. Uh, one of the challenges you know, in many of these problems, uh, including uh, the challenges I run into, is uh, uh, the issue about the how such systems were created and uh, were developed and deployed. It. Here is the uh, one experiences we seen very often. Um, we probably know that uh, the so-called AI production is uh, at this point, uh, in many cases, not too far from a handcrafted uh, kind of uh, practice, right? You need to do a lot of uh, uh, tricks and uh, know-how and a lot of uh, experiences, you know, to make Sometimes it is very hard to repeat the results if uh, you hand it to a different person to do the same thing. Or sometimes even you yourself do it again, you may not be able to reproduce it. Many of uh, also cost and uh, you know, uh, st stability and uh, standardization and so forth. This is very different from uh, you know, products uh, being made. Uh, in mature industries such as aviation, right? When we build an aircraft, you know, we don't we don't really craft it. You know, we actually uh, use a assembly line type of mechanism and build every parts ahead of time. And uh, then there are quality controls, there are standardizations to make sure they all work in separate parts. And then they got assembled and tested in various different ways. And of course, you can make many copies of that. And you can reconfigure it for different. Uh, application utilities. So this is uh, what uh, we know industry production is. But uh, what is, I'm going to say a few more words about what we see in current approaches in AI, which amounts to, you know, pretty much an end-to-end -end black box or sometimes a one-off customization if the system involves multiple, you know, such black boxes, right? So here is an example, which uh, deals a particular type of interesting challenges. Uh, so in medical space, we know that uh, we need to handle a lot of uh, different types of data. In fact, uh, you know, every subjects are likely to be uh, swamped, uh, inundated by different types of uh, data of large amount. And uh, this data has to be processed you know, by uh, you know, a specialized model in many cases. And then you know, how to uh, uh, integrate them uh, can be a very challenging problem. 
and how to even build every different model uh, using an efficient manner can also be challenged. And this is a very familiar uh, kind of uh, situation for all machine learning practitioners, right? For example, you know, uh, talking about data and experiences, uh, current machine learning algorithms and problems uh, are dealing with so many different types of data, right? So we saw uh, image examples, but we also sometimes need to deal with uh, uh, knowledges and constraints and rules such as a knowledge graph. Uh, sometimes uh, in a uh, uh, problem where your agents need to deal with uh, the environments, then you may be you know, receiving rewards by performing certain actions. And then such rewards can become more complex if uh, you are talking about uh, playing against uh, an auxiliary agent, such as a star agent. You may also encounter adversaries. And sometimes the training experiences can be very complex, such as uh, you know, as the human uh, experience, you know, in learning the piano, for example, you learn from a master in a master's class. And uh, it is very hard to uh, define whether the master is uh, doing supervised learning, you know, or uh, unsupervised learning, you know, or transfer learning. He probably just sit there and play a piece and ask you to emulate. Right? So these type of uh, each present a unique model challenge and uh, learning challenge. Therefore, as a machine learning expert, you need about uh, the universe of models. And here is the zoo of uh, ML models. Probably every you know, uh, you know, experienced machine learner uh, are expected to, to be familiar with. And then once you pick the model, you also need to go to the market of algorithms and heuristics to pick the right one to decide uh, how such thing can be trained using you know, um, likelihood-based learning or reinforcement learning, you know, or uh, adversarial learning and so forth. In fact, each of these uh, uh, training paradigm can evolve into a whole research area in the and receive Many of them, of course, are incremental, you know, from time to time. And then even after you implement the algorithm, uh, you need to uh, deploy it. You know, or run it, you know, on a certain hardware. And then you need to also be able, you need to also choose the right system. And there is again a marketplace for ML systems. And here you see names like from the server, you see, you know, uh, different algorithms like grading compensation and so forth. So it's a very, very complex space to navigate. And this is only, uh, you know, the problem for uh, implementing one model. But uh, we all know that uh, in production AI systems, such as uh, creating, for example, a uh, medical case from the radiological pictures, you need to invoke very often a full pipeline of uh, building blocks of the machine algorithm, each of which And uh, in fact, uh, we, in the past, uh, in my company, uh, uh, you know, uh, and uh, here is just a little summary of uh, the algorithm that has to be implemented and incorporated in such a system. You can see there are more than a dozen names and making the choice for each of them and in the with them, you can imagine can be really challenging. It's like sending someone into this maze and uh, really try to navigate up. So it's very, very talent intensive and uh, labor intensive and it is uh, beyond you know, uh, the capability of uh, many, you know, less experienced developers and engineers. I think that's probably one of the reasons why AI is still uh, not very accessible, you know, to the majority of the users. And uh, so now we are facing the problem of uh, industrial production. What does that mean, right? So for example, here, I just continue on the example I give uh, for report generator, right? Uh, there are some standard expectations coming from industrial production. For example, you know, this uh, uh, algorithm you know, is uh, working on X-ray images. What if for now I have a CT scan instead of X-ray images, right? And do I need to uh, redo the whole thing and uh, rebuild a black box? Or can I plug in a particular like interpreter you know, at the head of the system and then keep the rest uh, unchanged? 
And among the, there are many different tricks and the heuristics applied. It is not clear whether pluggable, you know, uh, redeployment or reconfigure. And furthermore, if you want to design uh, such a report generator for a different disease, then not uh, lung diseases, but uh, you know, heart diseases or liver or, or brain, uh, you know, again, you know, very often time, the system need to be reviewed from top to bottom. And then if you want to deploy the system now, uh, you want to export the system into a different country where a different language is spoken. In fact, here I'm facing the problem of, uh, you know, uh, doing everything in, in error. And then, you know, you need to also, you know, uh, uh, have, uh, you know, a new system able to produce uh, Arabic. Uh, can to redo the system again, or I can only replace some of the language generation model, you know, from uh, English generators to Arabic language generators. So this is the ideal case in industrial production, but I don't think it is happening now, you know, in our AI production. I'm not even talking about uh, more challenging problems like uh, writing a completely different type of reports. For example, if your data is not going outside of medical domain, say you want to write a financial data story using all these plots, I guess for not be rebuilt, right? And then deployment, serving, upgrading, everything become even more messy. So the kind of uh, arithmetic production we saw and the web producing the iceberg, there is the rest of the machine learning operations, you know, involving a long list of, uh, you know, a very dirty and the complicated engineer for ranging from data cleaning all the way to, you know, uh, you know, uh, elastic resource scheduling of a tolerance and the model retraining and the survey and the versioning, you know, all these can be a roadblock for AI to be production ready. So, um, now I'm going to uh, dive into uh, how we're going to be uh, able to get closer uh, to a production phase, you know, for ask what really matters, you know, AI production. Beyond, you know, in addition to uh, all the steps and all the expectations I just show, even the quality measure can be also very different. So here I don't show a few examples. We all know that uh, in AI, you know, the development are heavily driven by performance. You know, in fact, the performance reflected uh, in leaderboards or in benchmarks. It's a very narrow definition of performance, you know, maybe accuracy on those numbers. But uh, are they really meeting the requirements of industrial? So here, uh, I'm just going to talk a few examples, you know, that goes beyond performance and efficiency oriented AI to see what matters in industry. Okay. For example, I begin with this funny example, you know, maybe a simple quiz. Uh, this is the logo of uh, you know uh, my new school. Uh, you need to come. It's not very difficult for individual for a human being to recognize this logo. But if you put this together with uh, some uh, noises and uh, give them to classify, uh, some classifiers could. Uh, you know, uh, classify them into a different uh, university with high confidence, just because uh, they are vulnerable to some of these uh, noises, which is uh, hard to perceive by individual. Okay, so that's already an issue, you know, in real production system. How to, you know, uh, you know, be robust against uh, adversarial noises. And we know that actually that AI is not very safe these days, you know, in production standard. In fact, it is uh, pretty much missing from. And in these businesses, such as aviation, such as uh, you know industrial manufacturing uh, businesses, there is a entire different uh, concept and uh, and the expectation in safety. Here, I just want to say a few words to contrast the two. Right? So, in AI, we are talking about uh, a problem being solved if your algorithm can classify, say, an image with uh, 99.9 than say one error per thousand image or per 10,000 image. Right. But uh, if you want to ship a car and uh, get a uh, department transportation approval and uh, be able to uh, market it, or you want to uh, sell a, a, a drug or you know, like a vaccine and get FDA approval, we are talking about a uh, uh, that are orders of magnitude different. For example, the standard expectation for car security is now at the seven bar 
or whatever this to one error per 1000 image, that's a totally different universe. And uh, there are other industries which are even more demanding, such as the uh, air, you know, aviation and the uh, nuclear power plants and so forth. So how those uh, production, you know, uh, industry achieve, you know, those, uh, you know, seemingly impossible low error? Well, the way they do it is uh, very different from our uh, black boxes approach, you know, in AI. For example, to trace uh, the error down to, you know, uh, 10 minus nine, you know, uh, error rate, you need to, you know, build system in a modular and composable way. And then you need to follow up the error and also the uncertainty of uh, error propagation and generation using something like you can quantitatively measure, you know, uh, the chance of uh, having and also have a way to trace back where they come from. And then, you know, you want to even in individual components, you know, in this fourth tree. And then of course, high profile uh, failures will also lead to even tighter regulation. And uh, therefore, you know, uh, it is very, very, uh, uh, you know, uh, standard, you know, to systematically, you know, upgrade the system and then, you know, uh, building in new components that, uh, you know, uh, promote the safety and the quality in particular parts without tearing the whole thing apart and rebuild everything. And this is very different from what we do in AI. Therefore, I think one of the missing piece in AI production these days is uh, you know, the structured operation environment where things become more composable and more standardized. And things that are not uh, uh, very uh, you know, uh, much appreciated in AI is the cost. Okay, you know, when we talk about, when we celebrate the results of uh, GPT-3 and the um, humongous language models, we probably don't uh, ask uh, how much they cost in training. In fact, if you look at the, the literature, you will find that, uh, the, for example, the training a system that plays the AlphaGo will probably consume the electricity of a small city for a year. And uh, those are even more expensive. And then, you know, uh, this is about training, but if you talk about uh, using such uh, from uh, consumer oriented queries, then, you know, the cost can be even higher. And this is only about the electricity, you know, environmental friendly, be eco-friendly, then you need to also worry about uh, other, you know, carbon footprints, uh, such as, uh, you know, cooling waters and, and so forth. So all these actually really, uh, you know, makes AI a very expensive, you know, uh, practice. So how to, you know, uh, make some headway into uh, uh, doing better, you know, in terms of uh, environmental impact. And that again calls for a different metric other than performance or in addition to performance and the model fitness or good mathematics, you know, to focus more on, you know, uh, you know environment and cost metrics. And last but not least, even in our, you know, uh, familiar uh, training environment, we are now again facing the challenge of uh, uh, the need for, for example, typically when we train AI models, you know, we have this uh, uh, very, uh, how should I say, selfish and uh, 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 you know, uh, strong uh, mindset about uh, being algorithm centric or maybe people centric. So we collect data from all over the world to deploy our algorithm on that. Right? So this is becoming more and more difficult because uh, due to many regulatory reasons, security, privacy, and uh, corporate culture reasons, uh, the data are not going to be able to come to the algorithm. Therefore you have to maybe figure out a way to send your algorithm directly to the data and then you know, train it uh, remotely, but still achieving global consistency and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, maybe uh, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, using this kind of a distributed and the federal training environment. So these are the new problems uh, now industry are facing. Uh, in the past uh, several years, you know, my team has been uh, working on you know uh, some of these uh, problems addressing 
uh, the issues I just mentioned. So in the next uh, parts of the presentation, I'm going to uh, dive into some examples of these problems to give you kind of a, a, a taste of uh, a flavor of uh, how this approach in a way that uh, is uh, intended for more sustainable and uh, more practical be taken into the industry. So I'm going to talk about uh, both the first principle uh, based uh, uh, modeling and uh, mathematical issues, and also more engineering oriented issues such as uh, uh, composition of models and the uh, scalabilities and so forth. So I have a lot of materials, but I'm going to be very superficial and fast you know, to just go through many of the uh, highlights. Well, hi, First Eric. Uh, I'm sorry to interject, but, but your voice has been cutting off from time to time. Um, maybe uh, if you turn off the video, maybe the, it's it's easier on the network. Give me a second. Yeah, and I think it would actually help if you and Yoav and Misha turn off your videos. Did I turn my video off? Yeah, that might be helpful. Okay. How 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 do I sound now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Is better? Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me uh, begin uh, with uh, a few uh, more kind of a theoretical oriented issues, you know, uh, that matters to uh, production AI. And I'm going to talk about first. Uh, how you know a trustworthy machine learning problem, you know, entails you know or you know you know uh, you know impacts the design of the model. Right? So we all know that these days the uh, problems of uh, adverse robustness become uh, you know receiving a lot of attentions. The issue is that uh, you know uh, for natural images, you know when they are mixed with uh, some uh, you know uh, carefully designed adverse noises you can fool a system, which of course cause a safety concern. And this issue is not only happening in, in the computer vision domain, in language, you, know, you can also you know, replace words with synonyms or replace words with a visually uh, similar words and then get wrong results in predicting sentiments and so forth. Right? So this problem obviously matters a lot to uh, industrial production safety and quality. And uh, one of the issues underlying that is really that the selection of uh, the model and the loss function you train could have uh, a uh, significant impact on the trustworthiness of the model. And here is an example, right? We all know that uh, you know, uh, when choosing you know, a uh, uh, entropy minimization you know, uh, paradigm, such as a logistic regression, you tend to learn a, uh, correctly learn a classifier, which uh, can be very close, whose decision boundary can be very close to the data. But on the other hand, if you choose a support vacuum machine, you may have a different decision boundary, which uh, is uh, more robust against the noises uh, generated from data close to the boundary, right? And such phenomenon also can observe you know, uh, in high dimensional domains where say you train neural network, depending on what kind of loss you use, you may sometimes have uh, you know, decision boundaries very close to the data of different labels. And sometimes they can be pushed apart. So that basically leads to a virtual, you know, so what loss do you care, right? So here I, you know, defined two types of loss function. One is the natural loss, which is the number of mistakes you make for all data. And then there's also a robust loss, which uh, is uh, measured on the number of errors you commit, you know, for those uh, uh, data, which is uh, close to, you know, uh, you know a epsilon, uh, within the epsilon ball of the data. You know, but they are generated from adversarial sources. Are you going to make a mistake or not on this? In fact, uh, it is very hard to achieve a balance uh, between both natural and the robust, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, a, a robust accuracy. Uh, here I have a, a constructed example. You can see, right? So here is example where you know x is uh, uniformly distributed in uh, within zero and one, but uh, y is a piecewise uh, constant function. Uh, predicting, uh, you know, one when it is uh, 
you know, here and otherwise when it's into the epsilon region, it is predicting otherwise. Now, if you build a base optimum classifier, you can show to yourself that, uh, you know, it is easily achieving a optimal error, you know, for the natural loss. But it is uh, also achieving in the worst possible loss for the robust loss, which is always missed. But on the other hand, if you choose another trivial classifier, say always predicting one, then suddenly you are doing better on the robust loss, but doing worse on the natural loss. So these are the kind of uh, uh, examples that are showing you achieving both good natural accuracy and robust accuracy can be challenging if you train them separately. So one possible solution is to just minimize a weighted average that combines the natural loss with the robust loss. But again, here are the problem is that these two loss functions, which are you know, uh, zero one losses, now are non-differentiable and there are many technical issues in optimizing it. So recently we published a paper where we show a theoretical results that uh, characterize the, the differences between the robust loss and natural loss. And that's also a, a good uh, way to achieve a balance because uh, you want these two errors to be close and they can be upper bounded by you know, a combination of three terms. Uh, one of which is uh, a surrogate loss defined only on the function you know, for uh, natural accuracy. And uh, the other one is uh, a uh, regression term, which uh, is uh, affected by both the robust loss and also the natural loss. In fact, this, this bound is pretty tight. You can also prove a upper bound, a lower bound of that. But uh, in light of uh, such a theoretical results, you actually could uh, go forward and design a new surrogate loss, which uh, includes the two terms which are the function of uh, the training and you know, uh, function that you are going to, uh, to, to, to produce. You know, one is uh, about uh, the natural loss, the other is about uh, the robustness loss. Right? And if you start to retrain your model using this new surrogate loss, you can see that we were able to push the decision boundary further away from the data points so that they become more robust against adversarial noises. And uh, we've uh, released a PyTorch package, which uh, enables a plug-in replacement of uh, this new loss function on arbitrary original models. Um, not arbitrary, but the many different classification models. And as a result, we actually achieved a pretty good performance, you know, uh, evidenced by a number of uh, empirical results. So here uh, in 2008, uh, we entered a, a new risk adversarial uh, vision challenge where there are a couple of hundred teams, 400 teams and the 2000 submissions you know, uh, for uh, the adversarial challenges of two tracks. One is about model track, the other is yeah, and targeted attack track. And we were able to achieve uh, best results in both of these challenges using you know, the loss function and the mechanism I just described. We also have another competition where uh, we beat uh, you know, a number of, uh, maybe in fact, all the other models, you know, indicated here on a, a, a wide range of different attacks. So now you can see that designing the right loss function can be uh, playing a critical role in promoting quality of the model. But we have uh, so many different learning scenarios, uh, all of which uh, may entail, you know, different strategies of a model design. For example, we don't actually know how to design a, uh, a, a robust loss uh, for some models other than classificate classifiers, say how to have adversarial noise in the form of a policy or in the form of, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, active learning or other in, in, you know, imitational learning setting. Right? So when we look into the entire universe of uh, models and algorithms, as I mentioned, there is a huge marketplace, each of which use a different uh, mathematical form, and some of them are uh, even more complex heuristics. And this is not very, very convenient for us to standardize the design you know, of uh, different model architecture and different solutions. If we look at the world of, uh, say, physics, you know, it's actually very interesting. Physics started off exactly like what we are facing now in AI. You know, in the you know early 18th century, uh, there are different theories for electricity, you know, magnetism, gravity, lights, and everything. There are a lot of equations out there, and each of them you know can go at length and uh, and result in different solutions. 
but uh, you know, along the way, you know, there are scientists who start to uh, dig into uh, the challenge of uh, unifying uh, many of these uh, different physical phenomena using formulas like a mass square equation, uh, like the standard equation, and so forth. And uh, until now, you know, uh, at least uh, three of the four natural forces, you know, electricity, magnetism being already unified, and then weak force and strong force are all unified under you know, a single set of equations, right? So now we ask, is this possible to happen also in machine learning? Can we reduce the number of uh, formulations so that uh, they can be uh, put under the hood of uh, you know, a small set, maybe a single solution or uh, equation? And uh, then different instantiations you know, could uh, you know, lead to you know, the, uh, the implementation of different uh, machine learning paradigms or algorithms. So, Recently, you know, uh, in a collaboration uh, with uh, my student Zhi uh, Ting, who actually recently joined the USSD, uh, we proposed the following form of a standard equation, which looks like this. It has uh, three terms. The first term is what we call the experience term, which can be instantiated to capture different types of uh, experiences, such as uh, data examples, such as logical rules, rewards, and, uh, you know, and so forth. And the second term uh, is called divergence term. It is uh, uh, it can be instantiated uh, as a cross entropy uh, Shannon Jensen divergence or other things to uh, steam, uh, to uh, you know uh, to enable a uh, training mechanism. You know that is uh, trying to uh, you know uh, you know uh, iterate between you know, a student function and a teacher function. The teacher function is also known as uh, the variational approximation of the final you know, model that you want to learn. Sometimes you can also call it an inference network if uh, you are a deep learning fan, right? So this is a term that enables, uh, you know, a uh, learning mechanism between the Q and the P so that they eventually converge to the same thing. And then, of course, in the end, there's a third term called uncertain term, which is a self-regulator to make sure that the model is not overly complex. It turns out that this standard equation is uh, quite generous. Uh, you can, you know, plug in different types of instantiation, such as you see here, by plugging in this uh, data instance, you can recover, you know, what is known as the maximum likelihood, uh, you know, function, you know, for model estimation. But uh, if uh, you replace the feature function with uh, uh, this particular form, which includes uh, a oracle of a data generation and also an indicator function of uh, data matching, then you can you know, enroll the standard equation to recover what is known as the active learning algorithm. By plugging in you know, the, uh, the reward function, you know, uh, then and, and, uh, and the set you know, the teacher function to be the policy, then you can also recover from the standard equation what is known as uh, you know, the policy gradient algorithm. Furthermore, you know, by plugging in you know, uh, a uh, jensen shannon divergence into the divergence term, and by plugging in here, you know, the experience function, some adversarial mechanisms, you can also recover a number of different forms of uh, you know, the adversarial generative network formalisms. In fact, you know, uh, we were able to show that uh, most of the known algorithm can be recovered from the standard equation by instantiating, you know, uh, the, 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 the experience function, the divergence function, and the uncertainty function in their unique way. There is a table here describing how it's done. So it's like a, a tree unifying many of the originally seemingly very different formulations. But at the end of the day, all you need to do is uh, using one of these equations, you know, as uh, kind of uh, the vision problem. So the immediate uh, benefit of uh, having this formalism is uh, not already being exploited, which is uh, uh, termed as a parametric learning, which means that uh, given a variety of uh, different type of experiences, when you want to train a model that is uh, benefiting from all these experiences, all you need to do is to really instantiate the feature function to be a weighted combination of uh, data type specific features. And then you plug in this back into the standard equation and click start, you know, a learning mechanism. In fact, this learning oscillate 
to derive a potentially master algorithm that is uh, taking the form of a EMM type of uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, appearance you know where in the E step you are going to you know uh, you know update the teacher function to you know accommodate uh, incorporate the new experiences from the data or from other experiences and then this updated teacher function will be matched against the student function using a cross entropy term or other divergence term to make them closer and then you iterate until convergence right so in this bigger framework you can apply many tricks uh, to further you know uh, speed up or uh, you know make the model better behaving or more stable and so forth so i'm going to uh, skip the details for this part this theoretic work i think uh, uh, at least many of the originally divergent and uh, disparate algorithms can be now put under the same lens uh, to be analyzed together to achieve a, a you know more unified and consistent theoretical understanding and this hopefully will also feed back to you know a better design in terms of industrial productivity now beyond the theory uh, one other issue that uh, ai researchers uh, maybe uh, stay tend to stay away is about how to uh, build the models you know from uh, the theory right so building is uh, often taken as a engineering work but now uh, with, with, with what I just uh, presented earlier we can actually view a model as consisting of uh, building blocks for models and for algorithms and therefore you know the composition of a solution amounts to identifying different choices of uh, component functions or algorithms or experiences or divergence terms and then stitch them together into a pipeline and that may lead to a final solution so we built a uh, uh, a open source repository called taxa which provides a catalog of all these uh, different uh, building blocks and here i just show you how it works it's actually quite uh, uh, you know uh, easy you know, given that uh, we are going to be utilizing the standard equation as a standard vehicle to uh, allow plug in, you know, a reconfiguration or repurposing of different algorithms and loss functions. So say we want to train a machine translation model, uh, which uh, involves uh, data ingestion and uh, building different, uh, you know, model architectures using, for example, encoder decoder mechanisms, which is pretty standard. And then you identify a loss function based on maximum likelihood. Right. So this is a, a, a you know a, a very very uh, mechanical composition of the model parts of the, the data parts and of the algorithm parts. Now say you want to choose a different type of training mechanism. Say you are going to now measure uh, the quality of the model not only based on the likelihood score uh, under a language model, but also you know blue functions of uh, language quality. And we know that uh, in you know uh, these type of problems, we use a reinforcement algorithm to incorporate the blue score as a reward, and then you run a policy gradient algorithm to learn the model. And if that's the case, what you need to do is just to keep the early part as as it is, the model and data part, and then replace you know the loss function and the training algorithm into a different uh, you know uh, you know uh, uh, app, and then you suddenly get uh, you know a you know, a new implementation of the model, which uh, integrates both data instances and rewards. You can go further if you have uh, some adversary examples uh, to help making the model ro more robust, then you can also plug in another loss function, invoke another training algorithm, say a, uh, you know, a Gabo softmax decoding function as the loss, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, say, you know, a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, adversal loss as a loss and the discover software decoding as the training algorithm, then you can actually, you know, have a model trained under three or four types of different experiences altogether. Right? So this is basically a more systematic and uh, industrial way of uh, building the model. And if you want to have a uh, multiple such uh, model instances uh, stitched together, then you can also call another uh, library called uh, Forte, which treats the text uh, uh, you know, compose the model as a bricks and then provides a scaffold, you know, not only, of course, for text models, but also for models you, you know, either uh, derived or downloaded from SPACI, NLP, and other third-party providers 
and then stack them on top of each other. And then the API inside this scaffold can automatically you know, connect them and integrate them into a solution. So this is what we see to be a potential way of uh, enabling uh, industrial production, you know, using uh, this uh, first principle inspired design of, uh, you know, implementations and the composition. So after you have the model, the next practice that people often need to do is to start uh, uh, repetitively train it on different types of data. And the training model is always expensive uh, exercise, which requires a lot of experiences, right? Sometimes we need to uh, learn how to tune parameters so that uh, they can be uh, trained faster. Sometimes we need to adjust uh, the model architecture so that uh, we can uh, introduce uh, different me attention mechanisms, different uh, uh, capacity of uh, embedding and so forth, right? So that leads to uh, the problem of uh, say learning to learn. How can you actually learn to learn faster and better? So this problem recently uh, is also covered under the buzzword of uh, auto ML, but uh, here uh, I would uh, suggest that uh, the problem is uh, beyond what a, a typical auto ML is trying to do. Because uh, in auto ML, you probably are only doing hyperparameter search or maybe at most some neural architecture search, but the tuning space can be as big as uh, including different uh, training curriculums or maybe even configuring you know, uh, machine learning systems and the system architectures for more efficient distributions and the federation. Right? And also the me measure of goodness can be beyond just the intrinsic metrics such as accuracy and include extrinsic metrics such as environmental impacts and other things. So how to get this done more efficiently? You know, we need to uh, sit down and uh, identify such uh, you know, uh, agoristic needs for tuning in the, both in the space of intrinsic metrics and also in the space of uh, extrinsic metrics. And then we believe that uh, uh, there is uh, the need to automate this whole process so that we can kind of liberate people out of the loop for both efficiency and also more trustworthiness and repeatability. So mathematically, how this problem can be defined so I want to just say a few words about our way of doing that. So here is uh, the setup. Let's say, you know, auto ML or uh, uh, is about really finding some optimum points in a domain that can best optimize the objective, which is uh, the training outcome or the cost involved in training. And this domain is different uh, ways of uh, training the model, right? Therefore, the search space can be the range of uh, you know, all the hyperparameters, all the set of all neural architectures, such as uh, layers and uh, widths and depths and so forth. And we define a query, which uh, is, uh, you know, a particular instantiation, you know, of, uh, you know, such search space, say a particular choice of the hyperparameters or the architecture. And then we want to evaluate you know, the query, which is of, again, a very expensive process. So our goal is to define an objective, which uh, can uh, make use of uh, as few as possible evaluation to attain the best hyperparameter configuration or other configuration for the model to be trained. So this is a learn to learn. There is a double hedge here. It's not about training the best model, but training the best way of training the best model. So here, um, the domain or the space for optimization can be uh, quite interesting and complex. And uh, they can invoke all sorts of uh, technical challenges such as uh, searchability, differentiability, uh, measurements of distances of points and so forth. And that's why I think this field is uh, extremely interesting. So here I'm going to just briefly talk about uh, some of our own effort you know, in uh, going beyond the traditional grid-based search or random search. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, an approach known as uh, probabilistic Bayesian optimization toward tuning. So in a uh, probabilistic Bayesian optimization setting, uh, we need to basically model the dependency or the distribution of uh, the query X and also the objective Y, which is uh, the accuracy, so that uh, you know the distribution of uh, all these instances. 
And then you also need to incorporate what is known as a acquisition function, which defines the cost entailed by a particular query X. And uh, the cost is not necessarily the accuracy, but also say the number of examples you need to use to train the model toward a certain accuracy or other you know, extrinsic factors I just mentioned. And then there would be a probabilistic acquisition model on top of the acquisition function because you need to involve uncertainty as a result of the distribution of uh, X and Y so that uh, this uh, A function also have a uh, stochastic behavior. And uh, in the space of uh, natural uh, neuron architecture search, uh, the story are pretty much the same. Now your query is becoming a architecture and uh, the distances between different architectures could be used measured by a passing coding mechanism or other distance functions. And then you can use a probabilistic equation model to, uh, to define distribution of that. Of course, it will be more complex than just a simple Gaussian process very often it is uh, by itself a Bayesian neural network. Yeah. But uh, by and large, the building blocks for you know, uh, uh, probo is uh, roughly the same. It looks like this. You start from inputs, which uh, provides you, you know, options of uh, probabilistic uh, you know, programming language models, and then a space of uh, search domains. And then the probo engine runs you know, uh, cyclically into these uh, four phases. It first runs an inference model or inference mechanism on the PPL model to learn you know, uh, the uh, probabilistic distribution of the query given the output. And then it will be used to, this is known as the probabilistic acquisition model. And then it will be used to really compute the acquisition function given you know, uh, a query input. And then it will be used this uh, you know, optimized acquisition function to propose the next configuration for the model to be used to train and then generate a new instance of the Y and then enlarge the data and then go cyclically and train you know, both the model and the acquisition model you know, iteratively until you know, a satisfactory state. The output of this is uh, both the query configuration, but also Y is uh, the outcome of uh, your final training outcome, but also the acquisition model that we can use to generate more instances. So this uh, particular system now is also available as an open source, and you can see you know, a uh, high level display of uh, how it works. Again, it's highly composable. It basically allows you to plug in different probabilistic models, different choices of acquisition functions and acquisition optimizers and uh, Bayesian optimizers. Uh, here, you know, I'm not going to name the options, but you can imagine the simplest being a uh, a Gaussian process model, but recently, you know, we use, uh, you know, entire Bayesian neural network as a, a you know, a richer uh, mechanism to model network uncertainties and so forth. As a result, we can use this uh, mechanism to uh, uh, universally, you know, optimize or tune uh, a wide range of different models. I think in here we have uh, examples uh, for uh let's see uh, uh random forest regression for example uh uh you know uh i don't know uh, there are a couple of different models i don't see where the name is but basically the message is that uh, against uh, uh, all different uh, approaches the probable algorithm uh, seems to be doing quite well you know in bringing the cost down to a uh, pretty uh you know uh, uh, uh satisfactory state and also it is uh, universally applicable to all these different model choices. Last but not least, uh, once we have uh, a model tuned or need to be tuned, we need to also worry about uh, you know, computing issues and you know, beneath uh, you know, uh, the surface because uh, uh, most of the modern deep learning model uh, or even you know, uh, you know, other type of machine learning models or pipelines are so large that they uh, requires uh, a computer cluster, you know, to carry out the computation, right? And of course, we also run into problems in federated learning where, you know, the ecosystem is by definition already distributed. So there are also interesting questions here in terms of how to get things done correctly and also giving you efficient and, uh, you know, optimal results. So just a recap, 
we started from the standard equation, which defines a loss function. And then there may be a mastery algorithm like a procedure, you know, to do, you know, uh, you know uh, iterative convergent updates, you know, of uh, certain learning, uh, you know, targets such as model parameters. When data and the model becomes big, then we're going to run into such a challenging issue. Say the theta become too big for one machine or the D become too big for machine or in a, a, a federated learning setting, your data are already in different iPhones or in different hospital systems, right? So in this case, when you deploy a distributed machine learning algorithm, it turns out that sometimes you are running into, again, you know, hard to reconcile competing, uh, you know, uh, benchmarks or interests. For example, you know, it turns out that uh, when we want to implement, you know, a, a, a mechanism which uh, promotes the system throughput, for example, just uh, forget about, uh, you know, uh, you know, a communication consistency and let the machine just run as fast as they can to process data, you do get a better throughput in terms of uh, data processing, but uh, you suffer in terms of, uh, you know, statistical efficiency, basically the signals or the learning updates you get from asynchronous uh, data processing can be of low quality. Therefore, they fail to drive the model to convergence very fast. Therefore, there are again issues, you know, uh, on how to get uh, the best trade-off between these competing interests. So I want to say a few words about uh, both theoretical and, uh, you know, engineering design, a systematic design about uh, solving this trade-off. For example, one of the first thing one can think about is to redefine a loss that is uh, combining the throughput and also the statistical efficiency. So that's actually one of the technique we use. So issues, because uh, deploying this type of a uh, loss optimization algorithms in a distributed manner requires a lot of proficiency, you know, in system configuration and the system level programming. And nowadays, you know, there is this uh, whole field of system ML, which uh, presents a large number of uh, artifacts, which are really bewildering, you know, uh, and hard for people to choose because they often are specialized for specific models. For example, if you look into uh, what system configuration is uh, driving, you know, the GPT-3 training and uh, whether the same configuration can be used to train BERT models or computer vision models, it is very it is pretty much unknown, right? So we have all these choices of different building blocks or different uh, instances, how to make the optimal choice. So in the past few years, uh, uh, my team has uh, looked into uh, this uh, issue. In fact, we probably uh, are among the folks who make this problem even worse because uh, we contributed uh, also a number of instances, uh, which of course isn't helpful in making the problem easier, right? So for example, here is this one instance known as the parameter server. It is now becoming quite popular, uh, you know, along with uh, all reduced mechanisms to uh, give uh, distributed, uh, you know, training uh, tasks, uh, a standardized a universal kind of uh, system uh, implementation. And it looks like this. It's uh, making use of a distributed shared memory kind of abstraction and uh, kind of uh, providing a program interface that looks, makes them look like a single centralized set, you know, uh, memory. Right? But on the other hand, beneath the table or beneath, behind the scene, there are you know, complex communication mechanisms connecting the server with the clients. And there can be you know, asynchronous you know, communication, total synchronous communication or partially synchronous communication. We actually uh, worked on you know, uh, qualifying and quantifying the statistical uh, convergence implications resultant from all these uh, different communication protocol. And we were able to show that the quality of convergence you know, uh, for distributed training in a system like this is going to be impacted in a certain way by the amount of asynchrony and also by the uh, variance of the asynchrony resulting from the system. So this is a bound that is a very different from the traditional learning bound we see where you only see terms uh, coming from the smoothness of the function and, uh, and uh, the characteristic of the data distribution. Here, we have terms which are specifically characterizing system behaviors. Okay. 
Another instance of artifacts we built is uh, for model parallelism, where you have a too big a model in addition to data to be put into a single machine's memory. Then obviously you need to cut the model into pieces. Then how to cut it into pieces? We proved a theorem and we implemented also a system which says that uh, you want to group in a model, or you want to cut model into pieces that uh, those uh, redundant and, uh, and the heavily dependent uh, parameters or model parts need to stay on the same machine. And uh, those uh, less relevant or independent uh, kind of uh, components uh, should, could be distributed to different machines. Right? So this is a kind of an intuitive conclusion, but in here we were able to quantitatively determine, you know, how, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, dependent is uh, going to be called truly dependent and the impact on the performance. And uh, using the concept of uh, spectrum radius measurement, you know, of a parameter uh, matrix, right? And we were able to show that uh, if uh, you are able to identify a best partition of the model in such a way that uh, their internal spectrum radius of the components inside the machine is uh, small enough, then you can achieve a linear scalability when you partition the model into different machines. Another issue that is uh, now becoming trendy in digital learning is uh, the problem of uh, federated learning. We know that uh, you know, in federated learning, you use uh, a, as uh, you know, federated gradient averaging you know, to uh, learn the, 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 the model you know, in a sense. The hypothesis here is that uh, data are perhaps uh, ID across different uh, you know, federated agents and the, your loss function as a, a, a weighted sum of uh, distributed loss functions on each different agents. And then you can use uh, you know, a very straightforward kind of averaging you know, uh, technique called the FEDF you know, to uh, learn the model you know, at the central server. Empirically, it was observed that when the model are uh, shifting away from being IID. In fact, in here you can see a curve that if you uh, allow the FAG, uh, the, the Fed average algorithm to, to be happening in such a way that you allow every agent to spend more time on local gradient computation without uh, real time, you know, uh, case by case, instance by instance communication, then you are going to achieve a very, very bad convergence at some point. Here is a curve which shows you a mini batch algorithm which is convergent, but uh, also other algorithms which are different, uh, you know, latency on the client side. You can see that. So the reason behind that is very obvious, right? There is a kind of drift which prevents the local SGD steps, you know, to be, you know, offering accurate information toward global convergence. In fact, fundamentally, you know, when you view the federated learning algorithm as a uh, distributed optimization problem, and, uh, and then you have to run into a trade-off between the amount of local progress you allow for efficiency and the quality of the final solution, you know, that you, you want to harvest. So we recently also looked at this issue mathematically, and uh, we proposed a, a, a new kind of a formalism and to interpret uh, uh, federated learning, which is uh, called uh, a, a posterior inference perspective. We all know that uh, you know if you view, uh, if you you know a posterior distribution, you know can be naturally decomposed into a product of uh, sub posteriors like this, right? And you can imagine that each of these sub posteriors may be attributed to every agent or client in the federal learning setting. And then you know a high level algorithm you know for posterior inference for federated setting could be like this: in every agent or every client you infer not a local gradient, but a local posterior distribution. And then you communicate the information about this local posterior to the server. So you can communicate, for example, the moments right, of uh, those uh, distributions. And then at the server, you multiplicatively aggregate the local posteriors. Now here, we're not talking about the average, but talking about the multiplicatively aggregating the local posterior using this equation. Therefore, you get a consistent estimation of the posterior distributions. Okay. And of course, you are guaranteed to get a global optimal if uh, you correctly communicate the local message, local posterior to the, to the central server. When the local uh, sub-posterior and the global posterior is gaussing, 
then it's very easy. You can prove that uh, you know the global posterior you know uh, can be you know updated using you know uh, this uh, formulation, uh, which is uh, a uh, exact posterior averaging. Okay, this is different from uh, the Fed averaging, which is just to you know uh, directly average over different uh, mules. Here you have a uh, more weighted average of the mules, and you need to invert a matrix. You know, uh, coming from the local clients, which represents the inverse covariance, you know, of uh, the data over there. If the distribution is not a Gaussian, you can still use this equation. They now represent the Laplace approximation to the original distribution. But again, you know basically how far you are away from the optimal. So now, under this uh, new setting uh, known as the posterior uh, federated posterior averaging. Of course, there are also challenges in terms of computation, right? how to compute the local posterior efficiently, how to aggregate efficiently, and how to communicate efficiently. Uh, we've uh, recently uh, published uh, you know, an algorithm, which I'm not going to have time to dive into details, which uh, provides a pretty efficient you know, uh, local and the global uh, implementation of uh, the posterior averaging. And I'm going to skip the details for the interest of time. But uh, the graph here gives you a kind of a, a sense about how uh, well they can behave, right? In, you know, uh, in fact, uh, here uh, we are comparing, you know, a, uh, a fat average algorithm with uh, the with 100 local steps uh, with uh, a fat posterior averaging uh, algorithm with the same number of local samples. And you can see that the FET PA algorithm is converging even faster than the mini batch algorithm, and to a uh, you know a pretty optimal uh, you know final state, whereas the FET averaging algorithm fails to converge. For examples showing the same behavior on CIFAR 100 models, on Stack Overflow models, and a few other models. So I'm going to skip the bigger picture of a PL and jump into a conclusion. So when you are, you know, now, you know, running back into the problem of implementing distributed algorithms, I talked about a few artifacts just now, but there are more artifacts in here beyond federated inference, beyond parameter server and the model parallelism, because uh, you are going to work on different models uh, for vision and text and also for different data. Still, there is a need for you to make the right choices and compositions. So our recent work studied this issue uh, systematically, and uh, we felt that uh, there is a possibility to also sy systemize and standardize all these building blocks into you know, a uh, unified interface to allow you know, automatic composition of uh, SysML components. So this is how it looks like. We started off from, uh, say, a resource graph with uh, different uh, computers and how they connect it, and a model graph which uh, you know, encodes uh, or documents uh, how the computational flow take place inside a model. And then our algorithm known as uh, the auto strategy builder can automatically you know, turn you know, uh, this input into a piece of a code which uh, automatically parallelize you know, the, the model computation. And uh, we can compare our auto parallel results with uh, you know, uh, manual builders and we found that our performance actually is uh, at least as good, if not better. Last but not least, when you have multiple jobs running on a cluster and, and if they are competing resources, you want to schedule them also automatically. And that actually leads to you know, the last piece of the puzzle, which is a model scheduler, or maybe uh, no, a distributed computing scheduler uh, that is optimized not only against uh, throughput or statistical efficiency, but a combination of them known as the good put. And based on that, we implemented uh, a, a system called uh, ADAPTDL, which was uh, recently uh, published in uh, uh, this year's OSDI conference, uh, which uh, gives you a optimal way of uh, scheduling you know, automatically multiple training tasks. And here is a comparison of the you know, ADAPTDL results with uh, a number of other elastic schedulers allowing multiple models to run simultaneously. And we were able to achieve a two or three times faster uh, results than the benchmarks. So now uh, 
I'm a little bit over time, I'm going to summarize the results. I think there are many issues you know, to be addressed by our community toward uh, industrializing and productizing AI. And uh, just now I talked about uh, some of our own efforts toward uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, vision, you know, coming from uh, first principle composition, auto-tune and also scalability. All the results I just talked about, you know, are now made public uh, through a open source repository called Castle. And here you can see the compositional tools of uh, Texa, which allows you to build models. Uh, the workflow master Forte, which provides the scaffold of uh, stacking models into pipelines. Uh, we have the safe visualizer to allow people visualizing the training intermediate results and final results. We have the tune algorithm and uh, helping doing hyperparameter search and the uh, neural architecture search. And we have uh, the auto disk, you know, to do uh, distribution automatic uh, parallelization of uh, large models for uh, and large data. And then we have the adapt DL for scheduling. So we call this uh, project castle because uh, it is really, you know, having the uh, or bearing the aspiration of uh, 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 of, uh, of enabling composable and automatic and a scalable machine learning for a wide variety of tasks. Uh, I would uh, welcome, you know, uh, you know, users, uh, contributors, you know, or just, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, researchers, you know, to check out our code base, you know, in here uh, to uh, give us the feedbacks or, you know, uh, contributing your own uh, components and uh, and the modules into our repository for the public goods. This is all open source and free. So with that, I want to conclude my talk and uh, want to thank you for the attention and thank you for your tolerance for me going over five minutes. <laughs>